you for being here. Uh, we would like to start uh, the first talk, which is part of a, a broader program of <clears throat> public conversations that we're holding uh, within uh, our exhibition, which is dedicated to uh, Tashkent modernism, uh, Tashkent being the capital of Uzbekistan, and uh, we're focusing on the architecture that was built between 1960s and uh, the beginning of 1990s. It's a very important period for, for this region and for, let's say, the history of architecture of the region. Um, our research was initiated uh, by Arts and Culture Development Foundation in Uzbekistan, uh, which is part of the, uh, it's a governmental foundation. And the aim of the project is actually to find a way to uh, preserve this heritage, which is currently at risk of, uh, of being lost. So our project involves a very broad team. Uh, uh, we have, for example, uh, actually here in the audience, uh, representatives from uh, Politecnico di Milano, who are uh, Davide Curto, the expert in uh, let's say preservation of modern heritage. We have Boris Chuhovic, a historian originally from Tashkent, who has been fighting for more than 30 years to preserve this uh, important architectural layer. We have Nicola Russi, an urbanist who has developed a strategy on how to actually uh, understand and uh, connect the buildings on urban scale. And today, specifically, our talk is dedicated to uh, another member of the team, Armin Linke, who was asked to join uh, the, the, the research team to document the buildings, but not, let's say, as an architecture photographer, but to give a completely different cut and a different eye perception to, to these monuments. As you probably know, in the last 15 years, there has been uh, quite a few publications de dedicated to Soviet modernisms, different Soviet modernisms. But what, was, what we noticed is that these publications have somehow tried to um, glorify these buildings as some sort of uh, remnants of uh, like ex exotic uh, uh, culture that nobody understands any longer. So uh, with Armin, we really try to kind of change the focus and try to portray this building as something that's very important to contemporary, com contemporaneity. So uh, I will pass the microphone to Armin, who will start with a, an introduction uh, on his kind of broader work and, and his interest leading up to Tashkent, and then we will have a discussion about Tashkent at the end. Um. Yeah. So, thank you for being he here, and of course it's great to be at Renale in Milano, back, uh, and uh, see many friends. And um, so, yeah, I will, I will speak about my work, but what is also important to, to say that this is really a collective project. So, uh, as you said, I. I I try not to operate as an architectural photographer that in a certain sense goes to a place and then uh, photographs something and then this uh, is like uh, the window or the frame that is fixed and somehow you, you present this as, uh, as the view of the author or of a specific place. But I, I really like in this case to, to work in a collective way uh, where you are part of a larger essay you're, uh, as a, as a using photography as a, as a medium. And then this material is a material that is put in a larger, let's say, conceptual process uh, of, of reading. So what, what is interesting to me is, is that way at the beginning, of course, it was the production of images, uh, mostly the production of how human beings uh, use uh, space. In, in the broader way, starting also really here from uh, Teatro dell'Arte, photographing downstairs here in the Trenale, the theater productions for the magazine Frigidaire when I was 16 or 17. So you have a stage, uh, you have unity of space and time, and you can photograph this, but it's still a, a specific script of, of, of scenography. And so maybe this was somehow also my, my imprinting to look if it's a photography of architecture, more it's a, it's a photography of settings that are of scripts in a certain way, and the architecture and the, 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 the drawing of, a, of, of the space is part of a larger script in which then human beings begin to, to, to move. Uh, 
so if uh, so so for me it's it's also interesting to have this exhibition where on one side you look at the picture but then on the other side you already begin to to read some readings or or contextualization of the picture and and you create this dialogue between the two uh, the two sides so in a certain way photography is, is really the starting point of a larger conceptual project so uh, I will show some images uh, maybe I try to put them we decided a little bit more kind of more biographically in, in a time sequence of, of production and uh, I wanted to start now not chronologically but with an exhibition that was now I think 18 years ago and there is also Luca here that created the exhibition <laughs> uh, so here it, it was an ex in, in the other space uh, over there and we decided together with the group Stalker and a group of, of Italian architects and activists that did the design not to use the walls of the exhibition of the institution so in a certain way through this also have the building of the institution the, this, the empty space itself uh, being part of, um, of the sculptural setting. And again, the public is asked to do something to not be passive, but really push the wheels and in a certain way, uh, almost like editing a film by turning physically uh, the wheels. And it's also something that as a photographer you do uh, when you enter a space, it's like negotiating from which point you are allowed to photograph this space. Because photographing an architecture, and now I anticipate maybe some of your questions, but because, uh, you know, well, anyhow, I, I keep it for later. Um, so what happens here was also accidents. Uh, and here we go, I just put a, a, a series of, of images on, on my interest, let's say, on how space is used. And the, the question is also what, what we define as uh, modernity. And of course, I would start from, uh, I would propose that we start from the Crystal Palace, 1860, or, but also that we, we read again the book of Bruno Latour, we, we have never been modern in a certain way, that also this idea of modernism is a real illusion. Uh, in a certain way, what is nice is being not an architecture photographer, but an illusion photographer, and we come back to theater in a certain way. That as whatever modernist photograph, uh, photography we, 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 we photograph, we in fact are photographing a stage, a theater stage for a specific uh, uh, ideological agenda. Uh, so here we are at the Asmer flower market inside the airport of uh, Schiphol. This was about 20 years ago, but this space exists uh, still and what you see or what you don't see are the carts with flowers so the flowers come in from with trucks from it's the whole Dutch production but also they fly in from Central America or from South Africa are brought on this cart and the system recognizes who makes the best bet and brings immediately the flower to the airplane so that then we can have basically here in Milano 24 hours the the flowers in our uh, uh, in our house so in fact, it's an architecture, but the architecture, uh, if, if I found this building on the Libro de Guinness dei Primati, so it was the largest industrial building, said, okay, who cares how, who designed it? Uh, it's not about the authorship, it's just, uh, but it's still architecture, and it's, it was even on the Guinness Book of... Uh, <laughs> so anyhow, for me, it, it was a kind of metaphor also, because you have uh, logistics, you have economy, you have geopolitics, and in the very same space where you had the first uh, economical crisis that was the tulip crisis in 16th century so maybe we should put also the start of, build, of modernity. modernity there in, the, in this with this tulips crisis and then also I began to read the, um, uh, I, I, I was reading an, an, uh, uh, an article on L'Espresso reading about the construction of the Three Gorges water dam in China where they would move two million people so it's like basically taking a city like Milano it's not only the construction of the of this let's say sculptural landscape uh, archive uh, uh, mm, work but it's really destroying all the houses all the industry all the schools all the university and reconstructing them so it's not only the water dam but the whole uh, social structure and also the psychological of structure of, of removing um, uh, the whole population 
and so I, I found out that there was an Italian company involved in this, and then I began to also yeah, travel with them uh, and make this strange exchange. But what was interesting to me was not only that, again, the, the engineering or the architectural part, but uh, how then the infrastructure was used. And again, here we are, this is the Erpan Dam, more in the mountains, and you see the fishermen there that are, in fact, the, 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 the village owners that don't have any more their agricultural land, so they were using the water dam to fish the, the fish that goes through the turbines and gets a little bit stoned. Uh, yeah, so they were using the whole infrastructure simply to, not to do electricity, but to fish their fish. Uh, and again, all, all what is uh, around and all the, um, the working condition, this was an engineer. So it's, of course, 25 years ago, and things changed uh, very fast now. And these are also the water dumps that now produce the energy for uh, the whole industry and the products and the iPhones and probably this computer to produce this computer. Maybe it was produced with the electricity of. And yeah, and you have different kind of also mm, vernacular architecture. This is a, a club, a karaoke club, or the house of uh, Wittgenstein in Vienna. And here we have the, <laughs> of course you can say, is Wittgenstein an architect? Uh, conceptually, yes. Uh, um, or we come back uh, in the area, this is the Baikonur uh, Cosmodrome in uh, Kazakhstan, and what you see here is the launch pad of the Buran that was the Soviet response to the space shuttle, and in fact here you see the Buran that already made a tour of the whole world uh, unmanned, uh, but then the project was uh, after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union was laid down, but what is interesting that um, the material, the, let's say, the design of this of this um, spaceship was possible also with materials that were developed at the Helio complex that we photographed uh, mm, near Tashkent. Uh, Tashkent. So you needed this furnace to to bring this material at 3,500 degrees. That is exactly the the temperature that the, the, this space shuttle, when re-entering atmosphere, got heat up. Mm. And of course, uh, I was also interested not only, let's say, in this technological, let's say, uh, over-dimensioning uh, project, but also on how you could develop uh, urbanistical moments of uh, self-organization and, let's say, low-tech moments. So here we are, the Makumba Mela in uh, India, uh, Hindu festival in a city, Allahabad, that normally has uh, 400,000 people, and for a period of one month, here there meet 40 million people, and basically with very low technological infrastructure. So I, I tried to, to put also, mm, to look into this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, narrative. And yeah, this, this first, uh, let's say, interest in this um, large um, infrastructural project and also their, their political consequences brought me also to uh, Uzbekistan. Here we are at the Aral Lake, uh, where two rivers were diverted to, um, to enhance cotton production, uh, also in a kind of uh, Cold War. Uh, yeah. And we have, in, in fact, still in the, in the in the History Museum, uh, a nice display of, of cotton <laughs> here in one, uh, in one vitrine where you see the vitrine of the museum uh, in which you see another photograph. Uh, and this is the local museum and when I was there, this was already, again, 18 years ago, well, I, I tried to avoid this classical cliche of the ships, uh, abandon it in the, in the seaside and here, wh when we tried to reach with, with my friends that were um, hosting uh, me from Medicine Sans, from Sans Frontier, uh, we went to the sea and they really took uh, some water that of course is not drinkable, but just as a souvenir to bring back to the family. So this is a picture of, of them carrying these uh, bottles. And of course, this is also the water shop. Uh, uh, yeah, so again, there is another project that we we'll speak maybe later. Um, appearance of that which you cannot see. It. It's interesting that Mark Wigley takes this picture and tries to speak about infrastructure. We forget that we have, let's say, 
um, he looks at the picture and he says, we forget that we have which is Canali dell'Acqua, the Tubature dell'Acqua in, in our, uh, um, I'm mixing up Wohnungen now, I'm mixing up also German and Italian and English, uh, <laughs> in our uh, habitations, and, and we forget that this canalization connects us with the apartments nearby, but they really connect the whole building, but really they connect the whole city. So when we open the, the, tap. the, the tap, we are connected, we are a social unity. Uh, but we want to isolate ourselves in this idea of privatization. So in fact, we buy, also we have very good uh, mean, tap water, we buy the, the, bottles. the bottles to desocialize, to uh, reclaim our private space in this ideology. So, I mean, again, a, a reading that I didn't think, but uh, that's, what, that's what, I, what I say, you go to, that I, let's say the moment of photography is one moment, the next moment is how to read images and how to, to, to put them in a larger spectrum of, uh, uh, of performatic script of rereading or re-enacting re them with the public. So while I was uh, traveling all over the world to, to try to document this, this, uh, this moment around the, 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 the switch of the millennium, a friend, Piero Zanini, that is an uh, ar architect, but also an anthropologist, between, he's living between Trento and, and, uh, and um, uh, Paris, told me, but why are you traveling all this year? Why are you always on the plane? Because in fact, this very same thing just happened 60, 80 kilometers from Milano uh, or from München uh, in the Alps. It's just that we don't see them because these are, they are connected so much with a cliche that is, uh, somehow constructed in art history or from the tur tourism industry. And so I said, okay, uh, why don't you photograph this? And I said, okay, let's then try to make a film instead of photography. And we bought a film camera, an Afron 60 millimeter film camera. I had absolutely no idea how to make a film. And we tried in a certain way to uh, film never the landscape, but always film the depiction of the landscape. So uh, science laboratories, the museums, in a, in a certain way it's the most, or we even went to uh, Dubai uh, to see, to film the ski dome, but in a certain way, still when you are at the Sigantini Museum in St. Moritz, uh, maybe you forget that the, this painting was done for the Expo in Paris, uh, uh, 1898 for the hoteliers of Engadin. So basically, we think with irony over there, but our high culture comes exactly from the same uh, moment. Or here we are in Davos during the uh, World Economic Forum or in Africa, uh, in the World Cup of Climbing, and you have this, um, or the Dadi, did, uh, well, it's now I will not speak about the, <laughs> <laughs> the film, but again, it's the most claustrophobic film of a landscape. You never see the landscape you always see this depiction and we also filmed always with a 50 millimeter lens, never with the wide angle, that is the lens that, that you would use uh, for the landscape and we never panned the, uh, the camera. Um, and we try to edit it in a, sense, in a certain way as an anti-documentary way with Giuseppe Ilasi that is in fact a, a musician and you're always transported from one place to the other but you're never told where you are. So the public again has to recombine its cliche that we have or that we all have about a, a specific landscape uh, with the next image and thinking, okay, I'm in the next place. I, is this a, a reality or is this a fiction? Um, yeah, and we were speaking about, uh, of course, um, we, in a certain way, also looking at uh, some of these architecture, it's, uh, they're also very loaded with ideological um, narrative. And in another project that I did now 15 years ago for the Maxi Museum in Rome, um, it's, this is a project called Corpo dello Stato, and it was, the museum was still in the building, again a project from Zadid, but, and they, uh, they wanted to buy something from my gallery, but I proposed them, well, but in fact you are the first contemporary art museum in Italy run by the state. Why don't we produce something together? Uh, let's take the Italian constitution, list all the mm, institutions
institutions of the constitution and look in which architecture they operate. This took then one and a half years, so very similar to <laughs> our project, I would say. And very similar in a certain way also that, uh, of course, th there was a whole team from, from Maxi doing the pre-research. Here we are at the CNR, Centro delle Ricerche, uh, Cerche in, um, in, in Rome, or here we are at the Italian Parliament, but this is the infrastructure in the back. And of course, you have this historical building, so again, this, this question of this historical building that need to be preserved, they also need somehow to preserve let's say, the democratical um, agenda for which they were produced. But you have all this new uh, digital infrastructure that, that needs to be implanted, really like a kind of chirurgical way. Uh, so the, the, que the, the question, how do you renovate this building? Um, and here you see, again, is this modernism? It's 18, uh, it's 192, something like that. And this is the young it uh, La Giovane Italia uh, in, a, in a painting. So a very charged uh, ideological uh, nation building. Uh, so again, architecture for nation building. Also very parallel also, by the way, by, by the German history that uh, Okay, what I want to say is, uh, again, we, we have architecture, we have the picture as part of um, uh, identity construction, and maybe we look at other, other parts of, of the globe, and we look at them as very exotical, but we forget that we are, uh, let's say, architecture is part, historically, of this is a tool of, of uh, ideological uh, identity construction. So here, I uh, put this, this is the Banca d'Italia, so it's the oriental room. Uh, and this was the translation booth for another, for a economical meeting, so on the right you see Mario Draghi, that was at the time director of the bank, or here we are in, this is really a modernistic uh, building by, classical one, <laughs> uh, by Nervi. Uh, is the printing shop of La Banca d'Italia. So the whole engineering infrastructure in the center is keeping up the building, but it's also the bunker of the building. And the workers can work uh, in the printing shop with daylight, so they have the best quality, but of course they are controlled through the mirrors um, that they don't, si non cadano in tentazione. And of course, a printing note, it's a perfect edition because it has 15 layers of ink and they must be, these layers must be laid perfectly. So it's really a construction. If they are not perfect, it's a fake. Um, sorry, switch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe I go a little bit a moment, uh, we, we have also to look at the Tashkent picture, but I go a little bit a moment more into, let's say now structure, structures of, uh, let's say, once you have all this corpus of images, also from very different projects, how to bring them to the public. So um, here we are at the ZKM, Centrum für Kunst und Medien in Karlsruhe, where I was also teaching at the HFG for about um, eight years. And here together with Peter Anape of the Sony GSL uh, Lab for in Artificial Intelligence, this was f uh, 12 years ago, we developed this project um, Phenotypes limited forms. And the idea was that we had 1,000 pictures from my archive that were at the wall and the public could enter the space and kind of change the exhibition, be curator of the exhibition and change the script of the images uh, like you would edit a film. And so the exhibition would change like a, a biological, um, had it, a biological life. But also then you could select eight images, put them on the table, and each image had a, a RFID, what we have also in our European passport, and <coughs> recognize the picture and print in real time uh, a booklet that the public could bring away. So, so, and, and then this, this exhibition began to travel. This, here we are in the building of Oscar Niemeyer in uh, the Sao Paulo Biennale. Uh, and basically about 30,000 sequences were uh, put together so 30,000 um, books or editions selected by the, by the public. Uh, and, in a, and, and then with, it's what was also interesting that this project was financed uh, through a science fund, a European science fund. At the time, 
uh, topic was tagging, which now is obvious as we use it uh, every day in our social platforms. Uh, mm, and with, with Peter then we tried to make a book and we tried to look at these 30,000 sequences that were made to the, by the public and got immediately headache after half an hour. What is a good sequence? What is a good photograph anyhow? And so I asked Peter to write uh, an algorithm that would select, the algorithm would select the images selected by the public. So anyhow, every project is also an excuse to create another project. So the book in a certain way was a way to think what is this black box that we use every day or that with which our pictures that we produce are used by the companies that are control the black box uh, to select our pictures and to read our metadata. And so Peter said, okay, that's very easy uh, to let's use the basic of uh, statistics, Markov analysis. And I said, can you explain what Markov analysis is? No way, lost in translation immediately. So there's that way, again, a collaboration that Peter wrote a kind of um, scientific paper explaining his algorithms. And then we asked uh, uh, a friend, graphic designer, uh, Lord Giletti, to, to rewrite this, uh, this, um, this scientific paper. And this all went into a book uh, published by Lars Müller. And here you see also other images um, that were selected by the uh, algorithm. So again, a project is a excuse to do another project, and this other project is a excuse to do another project again. Uh, or a very important moment for me was uh, um, collaborating with Bruno Latour that was developing at the time this uh, website, An Inquiry into Modes of Existence. Basically, he published a book, a physical book, but the footnotes of the book uh, were not in the book, but on the uh, website. And, um, Together with the graphic designers, we ask ourselves how can be an artwork or a photography or let's say a visual essay or a film be a footnote to a text. And so uh, basically we, we made a design test uh, and I brought uh, again 1000 pictures printed with my Xerox copies. Here we are at the Media Lab of Science Po in Paris. And for me it was interesting then that all these pictures done, uh, let's say produced with very different self commissions or commissions were reread in a complete other way from my first agenda. And uh, I asked then Bruno if not only, let's say, uh, I was happy that he would use my pictures in, on his website, but also if I could use his text in, a, in, a, in, in my exhibition. And then I repeated, let's say, this, um, Mm, or here, for example, the idea of reference, what, what is a laboratory uh, or a collection, what is the different difference between a collection um, and an archive, or what is Saint politique, what, uh, how is politics uh, ref, mm, represented into architecture. So I repeated this experiment of, of, of image reading in this project, Appearance Which Cannot Be Seen, that was an, also an exhibition uh, uh, first at TEDCAM and then also here at the PAC in Milano. And for example, this picture is a, a picture that uh, I took during a vacation in Pantelleria and there was this uh, and uh, here uh, Jan Salacevic that is a geologist is also the secretary of the Anthropocene working group, a group of uh, geologist and geoscience uh, specialist that is trying to declare now the Anthropocene as a new era after the Holocene. Saying, well, in this picture, I see, in fact, uh, these three different elements. I see the, the ocean system, I see the atmospheric system, and I see the geological system all together inscribed in the, in the same picture. And of course, uh, in the geology, you see also the history of agriculture, so of the human presence into uh, the landscape. And again here, uh, together with students of the HFG Karlsruhe and, uh, and Linda van Dersen, that is also here, uh, collaborated also in our project in the exhibition, we tried to, to then develop an, an exhibition that would work more like a hypertext or also where you would have these images that are in a certain way also, it depends on how you read them, but they can be also very classical documentary uh, images are presented more as theatrical scenographies. And so, so the, also the exhibition would change every month for about, uh, and, and this was the, the setting. So we constructed really like a, almost a, a theatrical script and also asked Giuseppe 
to have in the exhibition the sound and the audio uh, of, uh, of, let's say, the specialist that would read the images. So in a certain way, it was almost like a more a radio drama with uh, photography or a hypertext. Uh, again, the, the public needs to move into the exhibition and, um, and activate the, the exhibition. And here you see uh, the same exhibition at the PAC here in Milano. And maybe one last uh, example on also how to operate. And often it's, let's say, the, the, the border between being, let's say, of just a photographer or being a co-curator or collective co-curator is, is often very, let's say, liquid. And here this is a project uh, together with Doren Mende and uh, Milica Tomic, so a curator and another artist. And we were looking at the photographic archives uh, of Tito at the Yugoslavian Historical Museum. Uh, and, as, um, and this is the, the, the first conference on uh, dec decolonization uh, that uh, took place uh, yeah, in, um, in, the, in this very same modernistic building where we also had the exhibition. And the idea was to open up the photographic archive of the diplomatic photographer that always followed Tito uh, in all these, um, in all his travels, mostly non-aligned uh, countries, and ask other artists to in, to use these uh, these images and to, in a, in a certain way, um, reactivate them or reactualize them. Uh, and here, for example, uh, Ethiopian artist for the, from the Ethiopian Academy that was also a very important uh, country in this, in this set. And of course, uh, Tashkent was very important for the, um, for the film festival. Uh, and maybe we can speak uh, later about it. And here you see the exhibition uh, in, the, in Belgrade. And of course, uh, or here at the installation of Otolit Group. And I, I tried to work uh, to react to this, uh, asking uh, the um, official photographer of Angela Merkel, that at the time was prime minister in, in Germany, to show him me his uh, uh, photograph, and in that way, looked at then they say this this practice of photography, diplomatic pho photography, doesn't change, and it's really very much connected to the building. So there is always let's say a team of scenographers or architects that goes to to first in, in advance and decides always the setting for the photo occasions. So it's really a kind of, of again, photographic and architectural practice, I would say. Okay, <laughs> now we, we um, go into this section where we, maybe we can speak, maybe we, uh, we um, I, I created maybe a, a sequences of, of some of the buildings and we can also speak together with, uh, with uh, Katerina. And um, yeah, here we are at the Helio complex. Uh, now, for me, it's very difficult to <laughs> speak about the photograph as, a, as the content somehow, because I already did the photograph and the re-speaking re about it is a kind of uh, a little bit uh, problematic. But of I course, can uh, I can yeah. introduce the building. Yeah. So we'll, we'll do this back and forth. I'll briefly introduce the building, and then Armin will explain why and it's what. A improvisation is a gem session. Yes. Gem session. <laughs> okay. So this, yeah, it's called Helio Complex. It's actually a solar furnace. Uh, it's built outside uh, Tashkent, uh, about 40 kilometers outside. It's uh, the last big Soviet scientific project before the fall of the Soviet Union. It was a major national investment. In fact different Soviet republics contended uh, the, the possibility to build this structure, this research um, institute. In, there was, I think, a possibility to do it in Ukraine or in other places, but then Tashkent was chosen because of its climatic conditions. It has more than, I don't remember, 250 days of sun in a year. It's very dry climate, very clean uh, kind of uh, yeah, mountain air. And therefore, it's ideal because the refracted uh, sun radiation uh, arrives in its, uh, with its full intensity. Uh, the building is actually, there are two of these furnaces in the world. Uh, one is in French Pyrenees, in Odeo. 
uh, and it was built, of course, uh, before the, 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 the Soviet one. I think this was a kind of response to, to the European. Of course, both structures as a first uh, intent uh, were intended for military purposes. In fact, as Armin mentioned, uh, Buran uh, shuttle, uh, for example, his, uh, uh, its, um, let's say, insulation and its kind of exterior layer uh, was tested here uh, in this furnace to see whether it can withstand very high temperatures uh, that are in the outer space. Of course, yeah, it, so it's for space, for military. Uh, now this institution is trying to convert uh, to more kind of uh, ecological studies, uh, or at least this is how it's declared on the, on the website of the, of the two institutes that inhabit uh, this structure. And th I would say that really, let's say that the front part of the, it's called the condenser um, of, of, of this institute is, is, yeah, is very similar in France and, and in Tashkent. While we think uh, through our research together with the team, this was our conclusion, is that let's say the Tashkent structure is much more monumental. In general, the science is portrayed in a much more monumental way in the Soviet Union. In fact, beyond uh, kind of the, the technological aspects, this is the actual furnace where the, the sun rays are reflected onto one square uh, meter of space and ceramic materials or other materials so to resist high temperatures are tested there is a views from the laboratory. But well, the last point that I want to make is that basically the way this building is inscribed in the landscape and the way it's treated architecturally and the way the monumental art is inserted inside uh, it makes it really different from the utilitarian type of uh, kind of scientific structures that you see usually uh, in Europe. It's actually until recently, like if you go, you know, my father is a scientist, if you go, went to CERN, uh, it was never about kind of beautiful architecture, scientists work. Uh, in technological spaces that mostly look like barracks. And only recently CERN, for example, started like to celebrate itself through by inviting Renzo Piano and doing kind of more monumental things. This was the attitude in the Soviet Union and th this building clearly reflected. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I also like somehow that we're allowed uh, to go into the control room here. And it's just interesting that you have this incredible large landscape uh, installation and then in the end, what, what is happening is really concentrated in just some uh, centimeters, one, one, one no? One so, uh, and then it's, it's a Samsung monitor that is taking, uh, I mean, the scientists look into a very uh, daily life. Uh, so I, I, I like somehow this um, also demitization. Or, uh, on, on one side you have the epical, on the other side you have uh, the, but maybe this material that we're telling us might be also very interesting for uh, developing next solar uh, cells uh, or, um, production yeah. materials. Uh, here we go, still go through the building that of course has a really uh, a great sculptural, uh, but also kind of mythological uh, uh, quality, I would say, almost a religious one. And it's, it's also nice to see uh, different parts of buildings with different functions that are also, let's say, uh, have also different hierarchical conditions of pre pre preservation, I would say. This was a glass sun at the entrance of the building. This was a day where it just snowed in the landscape. Here we are, one of my favorite buildings, also for its social housing quality. And uh, I had to say that I had to remember also uh, of the buildings too of Giancarlo De Carlo and uh, that also Davide, that uh, also uh, is here. Uh, I learned uh, that, that you were also working on the restoration of, uh, of, of these buildings in Urbino, where I also teach. So something also, there was a kind of Reconnect, recon, uh, reconnection <laughs> there. So yes, this is a very interesting uh, experimental housing project. Uh, we actually have panels here, if you afterwards want to see, uh, which explain how it works. And basically, uh, first of all, it was designed uh, by a woman, uh, 
with very strong will, who managed to convince the Soviet authorities that instead of refabrication, uh, a monolithic construction, construction um, should be made, which enabled this kind of sculptural uh, shapes uh, and, and, and volumes. But besides that, she was inspired by traditional uh, uh, kind of settlements, or let's say the old part of Tashkent, which are called Mahalas, which are basically um, low-rise housing uh, uh, structured around courtyard units. So she reproduced the courtyards in a tower every three floors, creating this kind of hanging courtyards, which were supposed to be the hearts of the community. So it's a kind of, in fact, this building uh, was named a vertical Mahala. It's interesting that she was uh, expecting a kind of um, the, a birth of a community within the building, but because the building was built uh, right before the fall of the Soviet regime, uh, obviously leading to a problematic period when people were quite poor. Uh, so rather than focusing on creating community, people tried to uh, kind of take more spaces from these communal uh, areas, uh, creating paradoxically much more lively and much more urban condition within these courtyards than the architect originally intended. So that's, that's super interesting. And recently they have created a, a kind of coalition and, and uh, almost, um, yeah, I would say a true community now to defend the building and these voids which are not used as originally planned but actually are the reason for the solidarity of the, of the inhabitants. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. And of, uh, what's the, the roof of, of course has again this mm, incredible quality looks uh, like a, a ship also or um, and then there are always these um, very interesting decorative uh, uh, elements uh, that are somehow also very organic and, and you see really the effort of uh, creating communal spaces and, and you really understand that somehow this effort uh, still works and uh, that there is really a, a, a community there that's, that uh, is woven, woven in, inside the, uh, the building. Um, here we are at the cinema. <laughs> so yeah, this is uh, probably the best person to speak about this would be Boris, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, this is a panoramic cinema. This is actually in the list of the buildings for which we made the inventory to, to protect, and maybe we later also called Davide to, to explain. Um, uh, this is probably the, the, the oldest building that we have from 1964, and it's the only building that we have that was built before the 1966 earthquake. So, and it's probably the purest modern structure without this kind of additional layers of ornament that later appear on most of uh, uh, buildings in Tashkent. Uh, it was uh, experimental in its technology at the time and consists of this uh, big hall that uh, has the shape of a trunk of a column uh, with a beautiful, yeah, beautiful uh, projection uh, hall inside and then a very large foyer that's super generous and almost like an urban space within the building. And what's interesting is that this, fest, uh, this um, cinema for uh, nearly 20 years hosted a very important festival, uh, which was the festival um, of uh, Asia, Africa, and South America. This was between 1968 and 1988, if I'm not mistaken, right? Was the last one was in 88 sometime, something like this. Um, so it was creating already this kind of coalition of countries kind of which, well, today are under kind of the, the global south uh, um, term, maybe not a very good term anymore. Uh, but yeah, so it was a very important place for international community uh, related to film. And um, uh, this function actually is being recently recovered because this building, even though it survived, the large hall is not is underused, and maybe this could be a good yeah occasion mm. to. Maybe I, I just put this picture that because uh, before coming here, I, I just was looking at to the Haus der Kultur und der Welt program in Berlin, and uh, yeah, it's interesting that uh, they took as for the new program of the new director, they took the 
this film festival as one of their main reference for the next uh, five years program. And I was saying, oh, wow, I just uh, photographed this <laughs> uh, with my friends. So uh, yeah, I, I felt that, OK, you, maybe you are. Uh, and maybe it would be also very nice to we, we have also uh, yeah to to look into this further. But there is some actuality potential, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a very interesting place. Maybe less well. It's still peculiar as an architecture. Uh, this actually represents uh, originally a concrete uh, waterfall. Then it got covered with a luca bond, uh, like what this is what happened the most. Uh, buildings from the 60s uh, in Tashkent um, because this Oops. is the Institute of Irrigation where uh, and this connects very well to your story about the RLC uh, actually most of the political leadership is formed in that institute so actually the institute uh, that kind of uh, teaches you how to govern the territory and the water resources and uh, so in fact uh, Armin got really uh, passionate about this big model of a water dam <laughs> uh, yeah. more than the architecture <laughs> of the building which indeed is yeah i mean uh, the the main the main entrance is interesting the last was quite utilitarian and, yeah. and of course this this model are now only mm, have didactical function uh, of course it's also this nostalgia of the analogical and the digital uh, because all the planning now probably is done uh, totally uh, digitally and this is just to teach to students okay uh, this is uh, the interior of the state museum of art uh, an absolutely beautiful building with a very interesting and heterogeneous collection uh, which goes from archaeology to um, yeah, uh, traditional artifacts to a rather classical collection, but also has some Malevich's and also a very beautiful collection of the 20th century avant-garde uh, from the region uh, and also the 20th century art uh, in Uzbekistan. Uh, the building was designed by a very good architect, uh, uh, Saveli Rosenblum, who created a very abstract facade, which you can only see on our renders because it's now covered again with uh, a very thick layer of aluku bond. Um, it probably was probably the most abstract building in Tashkent, really, really beautiful. And it had also this wonderful atrium that uh, Armin uh, photographed, which uh, yeah, connects all the levels of the museum and has uh, this uh, very metallic textural ceiling and, and wall. And through this atrium, all these different elements of the, connect of the collection uh, that are really uh, completely unrelated between themselves uh, somehow create a very interesting interaction. Yeah, I, I, I really like this. Some, uh, some, um, some of the elements, the walls of the ceiling that I, um, that I encountered through, through our tours, for me it was almost like uh, photographing like, let's say, a musical partition or a cartographic uh, system or uh, so, um, and, and sometimes you, this is also why some of these pictures are so large, because sometimes you really need to enter into these details and you see that these uh, larger structure, structures are, have different layers of zoom when you, when you enter into them. Uh, <laughs> uh, this <laughs> is uh, another museum of which we also have a model here made by a uh, thesis student of Davide. Uh, it's uh, formerly the Museum of Lenin. Uh, today it's used as a history museum, a very propagandistic uh, structure. And uh, what we're interested in it for multiple reasons, because first of all, uh, it was one of the uh, more than 13 buildings that were done, designed by the same institute in Moscow. It was kind of imposed on Tashkent that important buildings had to be centrally designed. Uh, and so it's a kind of um, Moscow interpretation of what traditional is in Tashkent, which resulted in this heavily ornamental uh, facade with uh, kind of reminding of Islamic uh, ornament or panjara, uh, a sunscreen. Um, and this somehow was one of the first buildings that legitimized this use of ornament within the modernist architecture and started being replicated also by the local architects. Uh, the exhibition originally was, well, about 
Lenin's kind of uh, impact on the land of Uzbekistan. Lenin has never traveled to Uzbekistan at all, so uh, there was a lot of myth mythology uh, created. And it's very interesting how later um, these spaces got transformed into a rethinking and recreating the mythology about the history of Uz Uzbekistan. So in fact, one of the things that uh, we would like to discuss with our preservation uh, project is to rethink also the exhibition and the kind of narration uh, that it proposes within the museum and that Armin has documented. Yeah, of course, it was also interesting to look at the displays to understand what are the mm, priorities at the moment and also in, in how the identity of, of is, is redefined through, through these displays. Here's some details, and here we are the Applied Arts Museum. And this is a carpet from the 60s. Or here we are at the um, circus, and here you have the um, very beautiful drawings, the original drawings, and the actual, uh, uh, let's say, exterior. Um, and the public, that mostly is children, <laughs> which is also very nice in a certain way. This is the rehearsal uh, room. And uh, of course, I, I liked all this, um, yeah, infra, uh, let's say, performance infrastructure attached to the uh, engineering construction structure. And uh, yeah, I, I thought it, it's a very nice and poetical way to rethink modernistic architecture. Uh, Uh, well, I, yes, I think you will probably see the exhibition afterwards, so yeah. I don't need to uh, go too much into detail. Yeah, yeah the circus uh, is interesting to us because, again, it's part of a, a standardized system of, so there were uh, standard types of circuses within the Soviet Union, and Tashkent proposed a very interesting exception. This is the reason why uh, we think it's important to focus on it. It also represents a kind of typology because, well, mostly in the world, circuses are more like, nomad like nomadic structures. They travel. Uh, within the Soviet Union, these were kind of permanent buildings uh, between which the different troops also traveled as well. So it's a kind of, yeah, uh, freezing a condition that's uh, implied for completely different uh, use. Yeah, and here we come to the, let's say, maybe to question to the question yes okay. <laughs> here uh. yeah, this is the market so it's, it's reconnecting to the to this very first travel that uh, I did some yeah, 20 years ago <laughs> yeah actually I first saw Armin's work I saw the other picture of the market made uh, in 2000 what five six yeah, maybe something like that, yeah. And I went to Uzbekistan looking for the market that was on Armin's picture. Um, I'll start with maybe a couple of questions and then I hope, uh, uh, yeah, you also will have questions to Armin or also to our team members who are here as well. So um, I'll start with uh, an easy one and then <laughs> ask the difficult one. So the easy one is in many of your photographs uh, you uh, use uh, of architecture use splash, right? Yes. It's splash in English, right? So, and I know that you uh, kind of uh, took this uh, strategy from, be because in the beginning you were photographing, you were working in fashion, and uh, moving people are photographed with splash, but then uh, you are applying this on architecture, on something that doesn't move. Uh, why? And uh, yeah, I mean, we, we see the effects, they are very interesting, but what is the meaning behind it? Uh, yeah, so I, th I would say maybe half of the picture that you see here were taken with, um, with uh, a, a very on-camera flashlight. Yeah, it, it's used in, in uh, fashion photography, but it's also used uh, by dentists uh, or mm -hmm. by forensic photographers. And of course, it's also used in theater, for example, when you photograph, um, uh, when you photograph um, movement, 
In fact, uh, very large uh, flashlights were developed at uh, MIT uh, during the Second World War to be mounted on airplanes, on bombers, because um, just to, it comes to my mind because we speak about urbanism and architecture, so I can tell a good story. In fact, the, they were used because the, the most of the bombing was also dur done during the night so that the airplane didn't get catched. And then after the bombing, they, made, they, they used this large flashlight to uh, make a picture uh, to see if it was the, impact. The, the impact was okay. And then they flew to the airport, developed the film, and decided if the pilot had to fly back again. So, uh, so there are many uses of, uh, in this case, and of course in industry to uh, check frequencies of uh, electrical motors. Um, and, and of course, it, it's, it, historically, it's a, it, it has a kind of also violent uh, inscription because you kind of uh, uh, cancel the local light and you bring in your artificial light in a certain way. So it, it's also uh, imposing something, but on the others, uh, and it's also interesting that it's used in fashion in a s specific moment, maybe in the, well, th this is now um, it's a bit anthropology of photography, but uh, you had, if you, if you think um, uh, pictures like until 1990, 2000, where uh, if you think, uh, well, I speak now about the Milanese public, uh, Vogue, uh, you have uh, Roversi or you have Ferry using large format cameras. And then you need to, uh, to, to, to change market. You need to go to the streetwear market. So you need to speak to, or to catch the public of, um, let's say, skateboarders. Uh, and then you have magazines like uh, Vice, or you have uh, yeah, people like Jürgen Teller, or, or even Tillmans working for uh, ID. And then flashlight is used because it's not used by the Traditional fashion photographers, you bring it and you break the rule. So it's also very interesting that advertising and marketing always kind of is very fast in gorilla adapting the system of specific market. But now we enter a very, a very let's say, complicated issues of, of reading photographic codes. But anyhow, reading, let's say, sociological codes are generally also in, in design, no? Um, I got lost, but yes, the, f the, f the flash is, is, uh, is also something, let's say, you photograph something that uh, cannot move, but y you hope that through the flash you in insufflire, non so come dirlo in inglese, to give breath to a building, in a certain way, you, you give it a kind of almost uh, animistic uh, uh, quality, but also this allows you to move through space as, um, with, um, with your physical body, and, and be faster because if you put down the tripod, you, you lose a lot of time or, you, you ha or to put it in an utilitarian way, to put it in a, let's say more, uh, um, in another way it's, you can move more cinematographically through the, through the space and have a multiplicity of, 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 of views uh, of, of views of, of it. In a certain way, you do also a cartography of, uh, of the building of the space uh, that is not only, um, so it's not only an aesthetical but, uh, view, but it's also more, uh, also, yeah, more a scientific view of it. Hope I could answer your question. <laughs> yeah, I think you gave <laughs> multiplicity of, uh, of answers. Um, I'll maybe ask, Actually, I won't ask the complicated questions that changed my mind. You can try. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, actually, I wanted to go back to Tashkent in a way because you photographed uh, all across the world. Um, and it seems that, yes, always the architecture is scenography for the next bigger themes that you're interested in that uh, are more linked to uh, geopolitics, anthropology, or other things. And I was wondering because one of the things that we said in the beginning uh, was this fact of n not trying not to glorify this architecture. So my question is whether the fact that you're 
actually almost more interested in other things is the reason why in this picture we get um, yeah, a very different impression of the building. Um, and like, and whether there are any of these buildings that you actually photographed just for the architecture itself, or there was you always need a, a kind of an additional theme or narrative uh, to build your work. And maybe if you also use Tashkent, for example. Yeah, it's a difficult question because uh, when you ask uh, for the architecture itself, because now it's it's a very dangerous question because now, now we have to define what is architecture. Okay. Uh, but uh, let's say what's, what I, I tried from the beginning here also in the dialogue with, um, with, okay. with the, the whole team is it was something that I tried also to do when I had uh, another project on, uh, on the architecture of Carlo Molino here in Italy um, that let's say was always celebrated with maybe this kind of voyeuristic part of his work or his design part, maybe forgetting that uh, uh, Carlo Molino designed the opera house in, um, in Torino. And in fact, it's the opera house that has il numero di abbonamenti maggiore in Italia. So it's the, let's say, it's not an elitarian public that goes to this, uh, to this uh, teatro lirico, but it's really the whole, the, the whole citizenship. So, and it's all this opening to, to the city through the, through the building or maybe, uh, yeah, through, through this friend, uh, Luciano Bolzoni that all made all this research on, on his architecture. He found out that he made two um, monuments to the um, Partigiani, Italiani. So it's very far away from the, let's say, uh, naked pictures that uh, maybe more the Ferrari are presenting, uh, maybe because this is what you can sell to the, to the American collectors, but maybe Molino maybe w would not even like to show these pictures, I don't know. I mean, uh, I got a little bit lost, yes, but um, for me it was interesting to, okay, you look at um, uh, what is also the social, the quality of creating social space in this building. And the same I, I tried to do when I had a commission from the Vitra Museum to photograph the work of Alvaro Alto. Again, to, to look how, uh, how he could create architecture that would relate to the external landscape. Maybe also because the father of, of, of Alvaro Alto was a, a forestry uh, planner and on and be very social but also very intimate in his building by selecting specific materials uh, so what was interesting to me looking at the architecture is maybe really what is the social use of this uh, architecture how do they relate to uh, also from the information that I, I got from your research how do they relate to the a texture of of the urbanistic um, history and how can you represent this um, through through the images and maybe not so there are for me it's also sometimes very difficult to photograph the exteriors I, I don't know why I, I really like also to, to use the, in, the in, to look at the interiors because you have let's say more the anthropological uh, yeah the anthropological traces of uh, the reutilization or could be reappropriation in a certain way. So how the users then reappropriate the building also somehow um, elaborating on the architect or the script of the architects who plan the building. So I'm interesting. Yeah, how? What is the this afterlife in a certain way? Thank you. Anybody else wants to, to ask questions from the public?
uh, maybe we have two different, <laughs> you as an architect, me as a <laughs> photographer, two different uh, answers. Yeah, but I, I this, um, uh, this digital architecture is, is very interesting. You, and you have also two layers, maybe one is how the digital now is used to, to plan the physical, maybe, and this is something maybe um, I, I can show some images from a project uh, that is called Image Capital that I um, developed together with a friend uh, that is a historian of photography, Estelle Blaschke. Uh, maybe, let me find uh, maybe, I don't know if I have this picture here. No, I don't have it. Okay, but, um, no, I cannot answer by showing one picture. Well, we were looking how photography is used as an operative, uh, mm, operative imaging inside the, the production of reality. So what he, I wanted to show another picture that was a, a digital theater that, is, uh, that we photographed in Stuttgart, uh, the Hochleistungskalkulationszentrum. Uh, so basically they have a supercomputer where now uh, engineers of Audi, for example, can get into the same digital theater and you, you can then change, uh, you, you have a car, you can change, I don't know, the lo specchietto retrovisore, the rear mirror, and uh, there is in the same room the, the engineer that says, okay, this will change the aerodynamics by X parameters and we will have a uh, gas consumption that will change in this way, but there is the marketing uh, uh, mm, person that can say, okay, if you change like this, there we will have X grams of more plastic injection into the molding, and this will change the economical parameter in this way. And then there is the designer or the architect uh, that will say, okay, changing the mirror like this is, has this aesthetical uh, uh, influence. And so often, I'm not really answering your question, but uh, <laughs> often, we think that somehow photography is depicting uh, reality, that's but in fact that's now... That's a typical question I didn't ask. <laughs> yes, but in fact now we have a digital process that in a kind of mimano, they mimic photography, but they are still photographical process, but they create reality. And the next step will be uh, when the reality is in a digital uh, ambient. Um, but that's also a, a very in interesting nec next question. I, I'm missing the, 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 the physical practice, but still it's a physical. Yes. Physical, the, the problem is still, I think, maybe the interface, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and this is, again, a, a theatrical question because it's a stage, these mirrors that we will get, these uh, projectors. In fact, they, they were speaking about theatralic uh, digital theater. So basically we're speaking again on, of, of theater and the performance. Anybody else? And you don't answer to this question. <laughs> no, I can, I can answer. I think that I find quite paradoxical that all this uh, kind of virtual world, they actually uh, somehow, I think often lack in imagination because they're not, imagining radically different environments, but reproduce the same mechanisms that kind of corrupt our realities. Uh, I think that would be my ah, answer. Sorry, I found the picture, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So, anybody <laughs> else? What's the attitude of the governments of the former Soviet republics towards the efforts to preserve these buildings? Well, I, I don't think I can speak for all the governments of all the republics, but uh, I can say that currently, um, well, I can speak for the one that we're working with in Uzbekistan, that uh, there, since I would say five or six years, there's a greater interest towards their own um, heritage, uh, actually on all levels. I mean. I won't go into reasons why we're focusing specifically on modernism, but the same people at the moment are also focusing on preserving, uh, for example, traditional settlements like Mahalaz, which are also being destroyed. And I think all of it kind of has to do with the fact that in 2016, there was a change of government 
uh, the country has opened up much more um, to the rest of the world. Uh, it's kind of trying to be more open generally. There's a lot more international investment. So the city of Tashkent, for example, can change much more drastically than it did before. And of course, like with, with any situation, the more you can change, the, the more you kind of wonder what should not, what should stay the same, right? So I think this was kind of the beginning um, of, of this preservation thinking. In general, Uzbekistan has really a lot of historical heritage in cities like Samarkand or Bukhara, where already, um, I mean, you can debate on, on the quality of preservation of the monuments, but there is a, a history and a culture of preservation in the country already. So we're just kind of adding layers, like we, we say, yeah, less monumental architecture like Mahala or the recent history uh, like modernism. Grazie Davide. And, uh, well, first of all, uh, the time needed is, in fact, to, to do the photograph, you don't need so much time. I mean, also we were rushing. <laughs> Because the beginning it was uh, that we would uh, photograph eight buildings and then it was 21, so. And I didn't, it was, anyhow, it was three, four travels uh, uh, and each one week, so it was quite long for my, And of course, between the travel, you, you think a lot, but of course I come, but you and Boris and you did the whole, so for me it was a, a wonderful setting because in a certain way I had already uh, some keys to, to read what I was encountering. So um, there was already a script. And of course, it, it's always very dangerous to photograph something that, um, when you don't, hear, don't, don't have somebody also with the local knowledge that kind of uh, keeps, you, um, keeps you out from the danger that there is always and there might be still uh, that, that's to, 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 to do your own interpretations because you, of course my looking to the building is the looking of somebody that grew up in the West, in the Mediterranean. Uh, so I... It would be interesting also to know how, how these pictures are, would be received locally and, or how they could maybe trigger also local uh, discussion. And that would be uh, for sure interesting. And then um, there is a lot of work then in selection because we really produce a lot of images and I, you know, we spent really months, I think, into, into looking at the, the material. Also, I prepared some images I think about the, so b basically in the end we had, we, we pre-selected something like 2,000 pictures and we hang them all, uh, printing them with the Xerox copies and then trying to look uh, building by building but also structure by structure, material by material 
uh, social use by social use, interior exterior, uh, function, uh, possible reuse, uh, uh, drawings, uh, how they could be recombined with uh, historical picture. So thank you for making the question because maybe it's also something so automatical, but then it's also like editing the film and definitely this is uh, not final, I would say. It's just the beginning and then uh, you know that you will do the exhibition here in the Trinale, so maybe all of the selection is influenced from the place because it, I mean the, the tentative also why, why it's, it's great to work with you and Katerina is that uh, you, you try to react to how to install them to react to the local history also here to reconnect to local histories. Um, yeah, so there is a lot of work and I would say it was at least uh, one year and I would say in, into these years, it was at least two months of really full and also thinking how to, yeah, <laughs> to stage them again yeah, back to, to, to theater. So it's a lot of work and uh, it's always good that when you start a project like this, you don't think, you say, oh, just making some photos, but then you don't think that you will uh, have uh, fun and also suffer for a yeah, for some years to go through it because then it's a responsibility it, to, to make the selection, yeah. Yeah, I noticed that actually the selection felt like almost 90% of the work <laughs> for Arvin rather than making photographs, yeah. which felt very natural and spontaneous. Um, unless we have other questions, I would wrap up. Uh, yeah. Well then, thank you everyone for being here again. And uh, uh, yeah, please come in the next days. We will have more events in our public program. It's uh, posted there. We have a talk with uh, Ram Kolhas uh, on Wednesday. It will be in the Trinari Theater and uh, you should register. Uh, then on Thursday, we have actually all our team here on, on the stage. And we will explain more in depth uh, the, the kind of approaches to preservation uh, the research and the urban strategy that were developed. So there will be Davide del Curto speaking, Boris Juhovic that now uh, stepped out, and Nicola Russi, uh, who was responsible for the cultural trail. And then on, uh, on Friday, we have another talk. We will be connecting to other modernisms. Actually, it's, uh, a sem uh, this event is part of a seminar that has been initiated by Politecnico di Milano. Um, where about every month we speak to experts on modernism in other former Soviet republics and discuss also uh, both what they're doing there and, and kind of our, and our work together to understand kind of in the larger scene uh, what is the potential of such efforts. Thank you very much. Okay.